Welcome to Pure Nonfiction, the podcast interviewing documentary filmmakers. I'm Tom Powers, the documentary programmer for the Toronto International Film Festival and artistic director of Doc NYC. On this episode, we bring you a group conversation about documentary portraits recorded at the Doc NYC Festival. And we all work in the same field, all of us here. We're working in the field of the human face. I mean, if there's one element of cinema that is really dominant since the beginning, it's the face. That's Vim Vendors, one of the directors behind the four films covered in this talk. Vendors' film is Pope Francis, A Man of His Word. The second film is Quincy, about the music composer Quincy Jones, directed by his daughter Rashida Jones, along with Alan Hicks. Third is Won't You Be My Neighbor, about Mr. Rogers, the children's TV show host, directed by Morgan Neville. And fourth is Jane Fonda, A Life in Five Acts, directed by Susan Lacey. The five directors behind these four films sat down with me at Doc NYC for a talk in front of a live audience. I start with Vendors. His past portraits have focused on the Cuban music group Buena Vista Social Club, the choreographer Pina Bausch, and the Brazilian photographer Sebastio Salgado. I asked Vendors what drew him to Pope Francis. Well, I was very, very impressed by the man the first time I laid eyes on him when he was elected in December 13. But I didn't think I was going to make a movie with him. I mean, I could imagine making a movie with Quincy and Mr. Rogers and Jane Fonda, but the Pope, come on. (laughs) He's out of reach. Until I got a letter from one of his collaborators saying, could you consider coming, talking with us about the possibility of making a film on the Pope? And I went, and I realized... I could make a film on my own. I wouldn't be restricted. It wouldn't be financed by the Vatican. It'd be it'd be total freedom, and I would have would have privileged access. So I said yes because actually most of our documentaries have started this way. Ray Kuda asked me one day, "Are you coming with me to Havana?" I met these old men, and you should see them. Hey, I didn't even know them. And Pina kept asking me, Vim, somebody has to film my stuff and nobody can do it. You like it so much, can't you come up with something? <laughs> so, and Sebastiao Salgado came to me and said, hey, I'm starting, started a movie with my son, but we can't get it together. And actually, we're only fighting. So I came in so, as a family therapeut. <laughs> So most of my documentaries are sort of on invitation. Strangely enough, I mean, really, Nick Cave asked, no, no, it's, come on, let's, and I'm not going to go in. So being asked by the Pope is, yeah, you don't say no. <laughs> now we turn to Rashida Jones. She has a multi-hyphenate career as an actress, writer, producer, director. Her portrait of her father, Quincy, is directed with Alan Hicks. I asked her why she wanted to make this film. Well, I probably should have just called Mr. Venders and asked him to (laughs) come make the film, but (laughs) um, I didn't. Um, You know, I think the the impetus for me (laughs) was that um, uh, my my father has is you know, decades deep in so many accomplishments. And because of that, it's difficult to tell his personal story because you have to cover all of the great things he's done over the decades. So there's no time left to talk about who he is as a person. And and that, to me, it always missed an essential thing, which is the connection between who he is in in his personal life and how he connects with people and how that is that is a fundamental part of why he's successful. Um, and a part of his talent. I mean, he, you know, hard work and 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 real musical talent aside, his ability to to sit with somebody and see the, 
the best version of their talent and coax that out of them um, and be sort of hard enough on them to get them to the place where he knows that they can be, um, that's that's a preternatural gift. And I wanted to make sure that people understood that about him and how that comes across in, in both his personal and, and public lives. Next, we hear from Morgan Neville, who's directed many cultural biographies, including 20 Feet from Stardom, about backup singers, and The Love Me When I'm Dead, about Orson Welles. I asked Morgan what drew him to Mr. Rogers. My relationship with him predates my memory. You know, it was probably outside of my immediate family, the first significant adult relationship I had was with Mr. Rogers. But like most people, once I became maybe six, I didn't really think about him again for decades. And over the last maybe seven years, he kept popping up in my life. I made a film with Yo-Yo Ma called Music of Strangers. And when I was just getting to know Yo-Yo uh, one day at lunch, I just happened to blurt out, so how did you figure out how to be a famous person? And he said, oh, Mr. Rogers taught me. And I, and I kind of chuckled. And he said, no, no, really. You know, I went on a show. I was young. He saw I was struggling with this kind of notoriety. And he spent years mentoring me to show me how to use fame as a positive force and a force for social change and not something that was going to ruin my life. And that was the first seed of many over the past number of years where every time I came across Fred Rogers in pop culture or a viral video or anywhere else, and maybe it's because I'm a parent now, that it just kept hitting me in a different way and feeling like it moved me. I mean, it moved me emotionally. It moved me intellectually. It was like, where's this voice today? How do I get more of this? And that was really the instinct that finally, about two and a half years ago, led me to say, well, maybe I should make a film about it. And that's how I got here. The film Jane Fonda, A Life in Five Acts, is directed by Susan Lacey. She created the PBS series American Masters in 1986 and has directed and executive produced innumerable portrait films. Now she's based at HBO, where she benefits from deeper resources than public television. Her portrait of Jane Fonda is among her most ambitious work. I asked Susan how she came to focus on Fonda. I read her book about 17 years ago, her memoir, and I was so struck by her unvarnished honesty about herself and the commitment that she made to telling a true story and to documenting a life that hadn't always been easy. I mean, I learned so much in that book about her that I think if unless you read a book, you would never know. So I became attracted to the subject. It's the most important thing in choosing to make a portrait, and I do call them portraits, is there has to be a good story, and there have to be people that can help tell that story. Uh, when I was at American Masters, uh, and this is no... Um, negative about PBS, but the, they didn't have the kind of money to make those kind of films. I went out and raised the money for 30 years almost to make a lot of the films we made in American Masters. And 17 years ago, it wasn't as easy uh, to raise the kind of money to do this sort of film. So it kind of went on the back burner. Um, and then I was making this move to HBO, and I remembered that that Jane was the newsroom, which was an HBO uh, series, and I said, how about Jane Fonda? And uh, so it, it all came together very quickly. She came on board 300%. Um, she did not have any control over the film. I think that's one thing that uh, we all face, is how, to, how do you achieve intimacy and trust uh, with your subject when they don't have control over the film? Uh, they have to trust you. And I did about 12 interviews with, uh, with Jane over a period of time and went with her to important places in her life. What's, what drew me to the story was there is so much in it that I, as a woman, related to. And I figured if I did, a lot of other people were going to relate to it, too. And that has turned out to be true. Um, I don't know how many people have seen the film, but she covers everything from, you know, difficult relationship with uh, emotionally unavailable parent, uh, the suicide of another parent, difficulties with motherhood, with learning how to be a mother, and how that affected different re relationship with two of her different children, body image issues, if you can believe that, that her father thought she was fat, and that drew her to bulimia for close to 30 years, 
um, you know, just on and on and on. Unfaithful husbands. There is something in Jane's story that I think everyone can relate to one way or another, perhaps not all of them. She had all of them. And she found her um, voice through activism. And she remains active to this day. And she's incredible. I have enormous admiration for her. And it's a story I wanted to tell. The day before this conversation, Vim Vendors received Doc NYC's Lifetime Achievement Award. In his acceptance remarks, he told a story about being midway through production on Pope Francis when he panicked that he wasn't capable of finishing the film. I asked him to elaborate on that experience. In this film, it hit me more than in others. I mean, we all know that feeling. We have a responsibility towards somebody's life, towards either a living person, in your case and in your case, or towards somebody who's no longer with us, and that is a huge responsibility. And we all work in the same field, all of us here, we're working in the field of the human face. I mean, if there's one element of cinema that's really dominant since the beginning, it's the face. I mean, that's the one landscape or canvas that really dominate cinema from the beginning. And if we only had close-ups, we could almost do any other any movie. Not quite, but almost. And uh, and in that face, we find so much, and the whole story of somebody is in the face. And if it's not in the face, you can't make the movie. And you have a responsibility towards everything that it, that's in that face. I've not seen Jane yet, but I saw Mr. Rogers and Quincy. And the responsibility you have towards your father's face or towards Mr. Rogers' face, all the goodness that is in Mr. Rogers' face, as a filmmaker, you have to live up to that. And you have to live up to Jane's amazing biography. So. And that can be scary. That is scarier than than a fictional film. In a fictional film, you have a story. You can live up to it or not, but it, nobody's hurt. But in our job here, we have a huge responsibility. That face on the fa- that person trusted us, and we have to do justice to the goodness or the or the genius or or the courage in that face. And as a filmmaker, sometimes you have to struggle to get there, to, to say, yes, I did justice to it. And that is tougher than any fiction, I tell you. So you evidently had a point where you were feeling real doubts about doing justice to it. And then how did you overcome those doubts? It's a very delicate process because self-doubt, <clears throat> nobody can really help you with it. I mean... You have to deal with it on your own. And you have to be convinced that you did your best. And that helps if you are. But if you're not, and if you feel, I haven't been honest all the way, and I haven't been able to really give it everything I had, and I haven't found the proper structure, and that is very useful and helpful. If you make a portrait, you have to, to, you have to find the arch. And if you haven't found the arch, and if you feel that there is something in that face that you haven't caught and that you cannot really represent, what do you do? You, you, I mean, you doubt. And some, very often you only have your editor. Sometimes you have a producer, but not necessarily. And uh, you have to keep fighting for doing justice to that person. And I don't know what the recipe is. in. Pope Francis, I thought I hadn't done it for the longest time. And only in the very, very end it came together. Actually, because we we insisted on having one last encounter. We had really agreed on three long sessions. And I edited for a year. And then I realized there was a few moments that I didn't have and that I didn't dare asking or that wasn't in. And so it was just the fact that we insisted we need one more time. And that made the movie. And that gave me the feeling that I had given it all I had. But not until that. 
Alan, let me draw you into this conversation. Uh, you were here five years ago on the short list with your first film, Keep On Keeping On, uh, a portrait of uh, Clark Terry, the great jazz trumpet player, and his mentorship of another young jazz musician. Um, and at that time, five years ago, you uh, told me that you were starting to work, maybe you already were into working with Rashida on this um, portrait of Quincy Jones. I want to ask you about, you know, this this kind of moment that we're talking about now uh, when you're in the middle of the film and you're not sure how it's going to uh, come together. Can you describe a moment like that that you might have felt in, in the making of, uh, of Quincy and how you overcame it? Whoa. Um, there's, yeah, there's definitely, there's so many moments like that. Um, I, with a movie of this magnitude, we knew going into it that we were going to deal with an immense amount of footage and I'm a musician as well, so I was very aware of Quincy's career musically uh, from from a child. And um, so I I knew we were in, in for a challenge and then we decided at the beginning that we would shoot for at least three years in the verite style. Um, so that came to about 800 hours worth of footage and editorially that becomes something where only organization can can help you defeat that and to help curb the anxiety that comes along with that amount of footage um so we we were able to really really organize um the the, the footage and then we discovered 2000 hours worth of archival footage of quincy's so can and i just ask you to tell the story you told last night about uh, how Quincy unveiled to you his archives? Well, that's a, that's a moment of anxiety for sure. Um, <laughs> well, we, when we first started film, filming and travel, we were traveling all over the world with him. And um, when we weren't traveling, we were we'd work in his archive in his basement. And he he was that kind of person that was just like, yeah, have at it, go go for it, and find whatever you want, you know. Um, so we spent about a year going through that archive and. Um, we scanned, I think, about 20,000 photos and ended up transferring hundreds and hundreds of VHS tapes and watching through all of this stuff. And we finally got through that archive and came up and it was like a celebration to tell Quincy, like, oh, man, we, we got through your whole archive. And Quincy said, um, oh, that's beautiful. But um, it's the vault, there's a vault. You, that's where the good shit is. you got to go to the vault. <laughs> and I was like, oh, my God. And so we went to the vault and... He was right. Yeah. That is where the good shit was. That is totally... So all this 16 millimeter film, there's all this stuff with him with Ray Charles and Frank Sinatra and Duke Ellington and all these old interviews and Super 8 footage and all, this, all these masters from, you know, his recording career. And, yeah, that took us another six months. And, and then it ended up being 2,000 hours. Um, but as, as far as coping with... That I don't I don't know I really have no answer to that. It, there's so many sleepless nights, and there's so many moments of us just like, oh my god, how do we how do we overcome this? But it's just like dealing with it day to day, and you can only get through so much footage in a day, um, and that that was it. Setting setting the goals um, to be able to you know, and then being able to isolate it into it. We're going to work on this singular scene and get this to a, a nice place and then you'd get a little bit of relief I'm like okay cool that now let's let's keep moving forward um but yeah for a long per period project like this that's excessive in content it was it was all about just planning and being prepared morgan while we're talking about uh, volume of content <clears throat> i want to ask you a question about that because it, in the case of mr rogers there's also uh, a, a great archive, and that you're not to mention all of his shows that you draw from uh, in uh, in this film. Uh, you've worked on other films with uh, voluminous archives, and maybe some films uh, where where you wish there were uh, more archives. But uh, when when you are working with a massive amount of material, how do you process that as a filmmaker? It, it, you know, is it something that you as a director 
feel a need to see all of it or is it something you can delegate or how does that work? And I do love archive docs. Um, and I've done many of them, you know, I can't look at everything of course, cause there just aren't enough hours in my life to watch thousands and thousands of hours on every project. Um, so part of it is just culling. So whether it's the producers, the, my editors, or, um, in this case, my, courageous assistant editor who watched 912 episodes of Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood to get it down to kind of maybe the 300 we should look at. (laughs) So from there, it's just, you know, there's a certain amount of kind of just separating the wheat. Does that change the way that person talks after watching? Yes. I mean, in fact, this whole production changed all of us. I mean, it's, I'm not lying about this, that, you know, we began the production a month before the election in 2016. And, making this film was our way of coping with everything that was happening in the world. And 2017 was basically us living in the land of make-believe, being kind to each other and thinking about these ideas. And it was this bubble that allowed us to exist in this proactive, productive, kind space when the rest of the world felt very hostile. And it absolutely affected how we treated each other and how we thought about it. And hopefully that lingers (laughs) for on and on. Um, but I'd say the main thing I've come to more and more the longer I've been doing this is just thinking about um, intention. And, you know, there's kind of a normal process of taking thousands of hours of footage and boiling it down to hundreds into dozens into, you know, multiple hours. And this film from the beginning, when I first sat down with Joanne Rogers, his widow, I said, I want to make a film about ideas, not biography. And she said, well, that sounds like a great idea because Fred always said his own biography would be the most boring film ever made. Um, But she understood, and we all kind of understood, that it was really trying to investigate these ideas. And in that way, we came up with this idea of maybe 35 scenes in the beginning. Like, these are ideas we really want to tackle. And we said, well, let's just do that first. And we did, and we had 100 minutes. <laughs> and then I said, okay, you know, this is a good place to start. Anything else from this point on has to fight its way into the cut. And we definitely lost scenes and added scenes, but starting with this idea of what do we want to say and not, you know, part of the danger with archive is you get seduced by the new shiny thing and you kind of lose focus of what you actually want to say in the beginning. So really thinking about the intention of what you want to do, I find hugely helpful, you know, and... Time saving. So uh, Susan Morgan's talking about structure. Vim said uh, something about structure. Find the structure to to give you the confidence of making a film. In uh, your film, the structure is built right into the title. Jane found a, a life in five acts. Um, and I wonder when you arrived at that uh, as uh, as an idea. First of all. All of your films are amazing. I don't know why you didn't make an eight-part series on Quincy. Did you ever think about it? I'm curious. We we did, but I think we wanted to make like the comprehensive yeah. movie. Would have been tough. Yeah. <laughs> um, the notion of Jane in five acts was uh, actually there very much from the beginning for me because one of the things she said in her book, and it's in the trailer, she divided her life in three acts uh, in her book. And... Um, So the notion of acts was kind of embedded for a long time. And then it was very clear to me as I did the interviews with her that her life, and she says it, was very much defined for a long time by the men in her life. First her father, from whom she sought approval her entire life, and then her three husbands, who couldn't have been more different. And the fifth act is Jane, um, where she... uh, becomes, as she says, a fully realized, a fully actualized uh, person. So it was there very much from the beginning for me, but the, the notion of acts would actually started from her book. Uh, but that, that idea of that each time we are making a film that we face that moment of, oh my God, can I really pull this off? Because I think, I, I agree with you, that the art of portraiture, you have a tremendous responsibility, not only the person you're making the film about, but the kind of context of that film. And creating a really good portrait has a lot of layers in it. And we create for ourselves these very high expectations 
of how we're going to create those layers in the film, which can't be visible. They're invisible. And that is really, it's really hard. It's really hard work. I mean, I think we all know that. Uh, and there's a moment at every film I've ever made, and they're all very different, that I am sure I am not doing that. And the person I'm kind of most disappointed is me. Um, so I always have that moment that I go, I can't, I don't think I'm ever going to be able to do this. And I always say to my husband, should I leave country now or wait until the film has come out? <laughs> and, uh, and I think we all feel that because it's, it is a tremendous responsibility and, uh, and they're all different. And, and the other thing is finding the right tone. And that comes very much from the subject, I think. Don't you think? I mean, the tone 100%. of the film is... And they can't all be the same. I mean, part of the problem with biographies is there's, you know, there's a big, you know, born here, did this, did that, and then, you know, whatever. Uh, that's not how you make these films. They, uh, they have to... You have to find a different kind of structure to make a real portrait. And, um, and I love doing it. When, when you're making these portrait films... In order to get to the good stuff of, of a life, is you got to get to the complicated stuff of a life and sometimes be asking hard questions, uh, maybe the questions you're afraid to ask uh, and afraid to confront, but kind of need to get asked um, in order to do justice to that life story. And also, it, ultimately, you know that the audience is going to you know, be wanting you to ask that question, even if it's the hard question to ask. I'd like to ask, uh, you know, each of you about asking those hard questions either on the, you know, on your new film or uh, another uh, example. I mean, Rashida, let me uh, start with you. When when you were thinking about Quincy's life, you know, was there a question that you wanted to ask uh, or wanted to, you know, e extract somehow that uh, that you were maybe afraid to ask? Well, I think when, when we started, I, I started filming very clumsily about six years ago, and then I um, begged Al to come direct with me um, a couple years later. But a big thing for us while filming was watching his drinking. And, you know, my dad has drank his entire life. He's pretty moderate about it, so it's something that you wouldn't necessarily pick up on unless you spend a lot of time with him and it was wor it was worrisome to to watch him travel and work and party and drink and stay up all night um and not get any sleep and you know he's he's now 85 so it's difficult to to watch as a as somebody who loves him and a daughter um and, you know during the course of the film for those of you who haven't seen it I won't ruin it, but he definitely suffers some health crises, not for the first time in his life. I mean, he did, even before I was born, he suffered two brain aneurysms. But, um, you know, that happening in real time while we were filming, when I wanted to, when we wanted to address the question of of that and, and the role that that plays in his life, was challenging. There's a huge ethical question there about um, what you include in the film. And, you know, we did film in the hospital and really... Originally, the, the reason to film in the hospital, my brother and I took some footage, was to show him, you know, God forbid he, you know, like we were lucky he made it out. Um, but when he made it out, we wanted to show him where he had been because he was unconscious so he wouldn't have known um, so that it never happened again. But in constructing the film, I think, you know, Al and I talked about it at length. It was important for us to show the real story. We didn't want to make a fluff piece that was never the intention and my dad did give us creative control said show, show me when you're done he didn't want to see the film before that but I think struggling with that personally and then coming to that moment where we where he actually did suffer a health crisis while we were filming was um like kind of the answer to my question which was is is your drinking a problem and the answer was yes it was and you know I mean he, again, I won't ruin the film, but he does quit drinking at age 82, which is, I don't even understand him. He's so so we still have time. Yes, yes, there's time. There's time for all of us. Uh, it's, it's, he's, but he's also, you know, he's no, he, there's no one like him. I don't, I don't quite understand how his brain and his heart work. And he's a, he's an ox, <laughs> which I'm so grateful for. But 
you know, that, that to me was probably one of the biggest challenges of the film was like what, what to include, how to include it, how to do that with grace and to, you know, ac accurately portray him. Among the many things the film conveys, it's that you should not set Quincy Jones's health as a baseline for your own life. Or, or anything he does, really. I mean, I know people feel lazy after they see this movie, but like don't, Lionel Richie says in the movie, don't try to do what he's doing. It really is not. It's a. It is a dangerous way to live. It is an extraordinary way to live. But like, it, it, just nobody can do that. I mean, he's, he's his own universe. Uh, Vim, let me ask you about this question of asking uh, a tough question, either in the Pope film or in uh, in another film. Uh, you know, time you confronted that and how you dealt with it. Well, you you see this in all your all answers so far. We have to immerse into the universe of that person. And you can't immerse without getting to the difficult or sore points. You cannot avoid them. With Pope Francis, it was definitely the, the question on pedophilia. It was the whole context of the gay community. And he answered this honestly and straightforward and with courage. I was disappointed a little bit, I must say, on his answer on the role of women, and I realized he was caught too much in in the rules and regulations, so to speak, of the church, and so I wasn't happy with that answer. And he realized that, and I asked him the next time again, and he at least was able to define the part of women today in a positive way, but I realized there was a sore point, which is, the part of women in the church. And that just remained like this. And you have to live with that, that your hero in this case has his weak points or his ideology. And of course, and you said that about Mr. Rogers, we, we talk about the goodness of somebody and you, you cannot keep the flaws away. I mean, with Quincy as well. And the more we immerse, the more it rubs off on us, and all of us go through that process. And only if it does rub off, we have a chance to have it rub off on the audience. So we need to really submerge, and, and we need to get involved with the weaknesses of our characters and their flaws, and, and only then, I think, we can say, yes, we've done our job. Because only then, if we immerse, the audience can immerse. And I think that's the crucial thing and you cannot immerse if you keep out the if you keep out the difficult points I, I mean i don't know who's who of us had to go through longer research thousands you said you had you didn't even couldn't even watch the 900 shows right and with jane i can't even start to begin a incredibly documented live yeah over documented maybe if in when she was young. So, I mean, we're dealing with people who are documented. And then to find a document that that transcends that documentation, I think that's the toughest part of our job here, I think. Uh, Susan, let, let me ask you this question about asking a tough question of, of your subject, because Jane Fonda is very revealing. She's processed uh, a lot of her life, but there, um, there are, you know, some complicated parts of her life. There's some contested parts of her life uh, po politically, particularly around uh, her activism around Vietnam. Well, for you, what was the toughest question to ask Jane Fonda? Well, obviously it was about Vietnam. <clears throat> what I've learned in, in, in these, making these films, and you're quite right, I mean, we, we cannot ignore um, the less, there are, everybody's complicated, and we can't ignore the complicated parts and still make a true portrait. Uh, what I've found is I do a lot of interviews, and uh, I don't. You don't start the first interview with Steven Spielberg and say, "Tell me about your difficulty with your father." You know, you get there in about interview eight, um, and I waited a while to do to to discuss Vietnam with Jane. I wanted her to feel safe because it's still pretty prickly about some of that, and um, and it was complicated for me. Uh, I certainly understood. Uh, the anti-aircraft gun. That was a mistake. She admits it was a mistake. 
Um, but the I famous have, incident where she was photographed in Hanoi yeah, she, uh, on a North Vietnamese yeah. for younger people who might not remember know, that. knows about that. But yes, yeah, she went by herself at the invitation of the enemy and was photographed uh, sitting on an anti-aircraft gun. And it was a really big mistake. And she admitted it was a big mistake. But she has some very complicated issues around the POWs, and which I had a hard time understanding. And we sort of we did two big interviews about Vietnam. Um, but you know, there I, I really mean that you you if you build trust, uh, eventually you can get to those places because the the intent in all of these is to get to the emotional core of the story, and you can't do that um, if you're just frothing over things. And uh, and but it is hard. I know that when I was doing the film on Leonard Bernstein, I was very concerned about his family, who I got to know, and, and I loved this character. He was not alive when I made the film. But I was very concerned about how to present the complications of his life. In particular, I mean, he was the most complicated man ever, but in particular, his conflict between whether he was a family man or a homosexual, and how his family was going to handle that and uh, again, you don't do that right off the bat. Uh, but um, it also helps to not. It also helps for there to be time. People always ask me why I waited so long to make a film on Leonard Bernstein, which I think I started the American Master series in order to be able to do. Um, and I said because well, every, everybody had to have therapy, ten years of therapy first uh, before I can make this film. Uh, so people also have to be ready to go there and. Um, it, you have to find the right time. Uh, Morgan, in the case of Mr. Rogers, uh, he was deceased by the time he started making this film, so it's not like you're interviewing him. Were there other tough questions that you felt you had to ask p uh, people in his life? Yeah, I mean, I think Susan's right that you save those questions for the end. <laughs> you know, and it's not just because you don't know how it's going to go, but it's because you've a you're at maximum trust at that point. And... Um, and I've had every witch experience on, on different films. Um, the Mr. Rogers film, it was, uh, the strange thing about it was, I mean, the last thing any of us ever want to do is kind of hagiography and because it, it's, it's two dimensional and, uh, and people are complicated. So when I finally was kind of given the blessing by Joanne and the, the Fred Rogers estate to make this film and that blessing was, make the film you want, we will have no control. And, you know, that level of trust they were giving me. Um, with that trust, Joanne Rogers said to me, don't make Fred into a saint. And I thought that was so interesting, because in one way, he's the most sanctifiable person there is. I mean, and, but what I think, what I took that to really mean, I thought a lot about it in different ways, is that, um, I mean, not, he struggled very much as a, is a, almost like a tortured artist trying to figure out, am I doing enough? He was riddled with doubt from his earliest days to his deathbed. And in the popular conception of him, he was somebody who was just this kind of two-dimensional version of goodness and kindness and niceness, not understanding both the willpower and the struggle that went into that. And I think for us as an audience to treat him that way keeps him in that two-dimensional box. And it also doesn't ask the audience to have to measure up to it. It absolves us as an audience from having to try and struggle to do good works too. I felt like for all those reasons, it was really then drilling down into things like the memos and the letters and, and, and then talking to Joanne and the boys, his sons, who had never done an interview before, to understand more of the human that was there and not, not the image which we all had. And, you know, I'm sure we would all agree, there's nothing you want to hear more from your subject, your subject's estate, than don't make him into a saint, <laughs> you know, because it's, it's that permission to actually be honest, which is all we're trying to do. Can I add one thing that uh, I make, mostly make films about people who are creative, in the creative world, and their work and that combination of bringing that life together with the work and understanding where it comes from and all that is a big part of what I do. And so a lot of times I face the question of criticism. Uh, not, you know, every artist has critics and sometimes they are valid. Uh, and I find that one of the, the thorniest things to do is because you have to include it, but you also don't want your subject to hate you at the end of the film. 
So it's a, it's a balancing act. Yeah, I and call that inoculation interviews. <laughs> I mean, it's taking, because it's the perfect thing to do if, if a film, and I, I could think of a lot of films I've seen that I wish had this in it, but I've given this advice to other people too. Take somebody who disagrees with the premise of your film and put them in the middle of your film, and your film will build antibodies, and it will build dimension, and it will conquer those things. You know, it's, it's, it's important to do that. And in fact, I've done that in other films, people who... 100% disagree with the premise of my film. And they're some of my favorite things I've ever put into my films. That's, I was going to pick up on something you just said. Because all of us loved our subjects. So we have affection for the people we spent years on. And that is the biggest difficulty, I think, of our profession here as we're sitting here, to find a language for affection. Because the one language that is clearly established in television and movies is the language of the critical distance that is relatively easy i must say i don't want to i don't want to bash it but it's relatively easy but to find a language of affection that does in itself has an attitude towards that person is much more difficult it is and, and you exactly at that border, when you ask the difficult questions and when you have the trust, you still have to find a language for that affection. And if you don't have a language, it's just, well, you're just adoring somebody and that is not good enough. It's not good enough if you just adore Mr. Rogers. And you did that so beautifully because it... And I'm, <laughs> I'm happy to find out that his wife thought he shouldn't be painted as a saint because he probably lived with a saint so so but to find a language of affection is is really one of the hardest jobs in the documentary field it's quite easy to say to distance yourself from something and but to be close to something and like it and not be just glibberish that's difficult and I really adore your films for that. Vim talked earlier about the landscape of the face and how, how that is critical to all these films and probably all films. And that is such a key building block of any biographical film is how you're going to conduct an interview, how you're going to frame uh, that subject in, a, in an interesting way. And Alan, uh, you talked about your intention from the beginning to film this portrait of Quincy in an observational uh, way, as opposed to sitting him down uh, with a fiscus plant behind him and um, do an interview. Um, can you talk about you know the the visual approach that that you took to this film to 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 capture the landscape of the face that that Vim was describing? Yeah. Um, well, just before I jump to that, <clears throat> I just want to give a shout out to Vim that when I was in high school. The one of the first documentaries I saw was Bonavista Social Club, and <clears throat> it was the first film that I'd seen that moved me. And I was young, you know, I was a kid and and studying music, and was able to see a document where it brought me to tears as a child. And I was just, I just couldn't believe that that had happened. And it inspired so many of my friends. And we're from a country town in Australia to get into Afro Cuban music, you know. So we're like jamming, you know, in Wollongong to all this Afro Cuban stuff. And it inspired, it inspired me so much that when it came to try and make my first film, which is uh, Keep On Keeping On, the first thing I did was sit down and watch that movie. And the thing that came to mind was that this is a time capsule. What he's what he's done is is going to last so so much further than all of us. And um, when I'm in the editing bay, that's actually something I write on the wall. So yeah, I always write time capsule just to remind me of like this is when he set the standard for what I strive for so i just wanted to give you that little bit mate it's it's huge for me and i really appreciate it 
Um, and then, so for, for this for this film, uh, we didn't want to sit down and do interviews with Quincy. Um, y- you know, when people get older, that they, they get anecdotes and stories become condensed and they kind of shift over time. Um, so what we w- wanted to do was get to as close to the source of the story and use that. So he, luck, luckily Quincy almost 30 years ago had done an autobiography, so there's a lot of information there. And also having um, – finding this, this archive, we were able to find interviews and things that happened in the period. So Rashida mentioned that Quincy had a double brain aneurysm in the 70s. We found audio of him sitting on the hospital bed talking to somebody mm-hmm. about that aneurysm, like the moment that it, he, he'd come out of the surgery – and he has a story about that today, but just to be able to plant ourselves into each era uh, wherever we could, like Frank Sinatra talking about Quincy in the era. Um, so we, we went for that thing of no, no talking heads, have, have the story be a verite, fly on the wall, where we don't interfere. We just sit and observe his life and, and find what we can from his past and in, in interweave, so you you get to learn about him as a man in in the current day, and see how that interacts with his past. Um, and there's it's just some crazy stuff like him in his past. One of the things that his grandmother is an ex-slave, and he grows up eating rats. And then you you see him working on this uh, museum, the African American Museum. And he's – that's his big thing in, in the current day is like he, his goal after he nearly nearly dies um, is to, to try and do this huge concert and celebration um, of the Afri- African-American people and to see that relationship from his past, that he where he came from and then something that's in verite and, and you uh, can hopefully understand like why he's so passionate about what, what it is – in, in that, that day without us sitting down and asking, why are you so passionate about, you know? Um, so that, that's just, that was our approach from the, from the beginning is to just take, take it from, from that lens. Susan, uh, let me ask you about this landscape of the face. You are conducting a lot of sit down interviews uh, with Jane and throughout your whole career, that's a real building block of of your films is framing the interview uh, to camera, and uh, and and I love to hear what you've you know learned over the years doing that and how you approach it. Be very prepared. Um, you don't sit down with Steven Spielberg uh, to talk about his work without really really knowing his work. Uh, the first interview will not become a second one. <laughs> so, you, uh, I mean, that'd be my first advice: is do your homework um, and and be engaging. Uh, it's not a quiz and it's not an interrogation. It's a conversation, and uh, the more it is a conversation, the better. So, I think that everyone's skills in this area are, are different. Um, I know that I can say this: when I did my first film, which was on Rod Serling. My mistake. Creator of Twilight Zone, again, yeah, for the oh, younger people. The creator the of the Twilight Zone, and a, a, also a very complicated story, um, and a really interesting one. I made the mistake of wanting the people I was interviewing to know how smart I was. So I, I talked too much. <laughs> and uh, and I, when I read the transcripts, I go, what a jerk, you know? Uh, and so I learned over the years to, to not say very much. I mean, ask really good questions, know what you're going for, know what a good follow-up will be because you are informed and, and prepared, but you know, not say too much. Um, and that's that's hard lesson to learn, actually. Don't you find a little bit? Sometimes you Absolutely. actually want to say stuff. Sometimes and, you should play dumb, too. Yeah, yeah. It's um, very helpful. Yeah. And I don't know that they have too much more to say on that subject. Um, just don't sit down with... These are extraordinary people that we're making films about. And um, you really know your subject. Uh, that's a very good answer. 
I was thinking more uh, visually about how you approach, but let me ask Morgan that question because Morgan, you also work in, with this building block. Sure, and I, you know, I know you used a lot of close-ups, you know, especially for a woman of her age. I thought that was an interesting and choice. I love faces too, so I, I don't like wide interviews generally. Um, and just to give give you more props, them that the uh, the Salgado, the main interview in Salt of the Earth, where he's looking at his photos, like. One of my all-time favorite interview setups um, because you get to see him in relation to his work, and the viewer has that. For anyone in the audience who hasn't uh, seen that film, Insult the Earth, Vim found this way to kind of project a photograph with Sebastian Salgado's face behind it, uh, so you see both Salgado's face and the photograph. It's amazing. I mean, for this, um, it's the first time I've ever done interviews where people are speaking direct to camera. And that's because that's what Fred Rogers did. You know, he always spoke directly to camera to one child. He never said, hi, kids. It was, how are you doing? So kids believe they had a one-on-one relationship with him. So taking a page from that, I wanted every interviewee to be speaking kind of directly to, to the viewer. So it felt like it was this, this direct, very kind of intimate um, connection, which, yeah, I, I was very happy with. Um, but... Ultimately, just to pivot a little bit, um, something that I keep thinking about as we've been talking about these things today is that um, people don't think of documentaries as being about us as filmmakers because we are documenting other people's lives. But I feel like more and more in hearing um, what everybody's saying, particularly what Susan's saying, is I've come to realize the longer I've been doing this, how much how much autobiography is in this biography. <laughs> And I think we choose subjects because there are things we want to explore and our personalities come through. And I feel like that's something I haven't heard people talk that much about, but I feel like I've come to really understand whether or not I actually admitted it to myself for a long time, how much of myself I put into each film. I think that's very true. Vim, let me bring this uh, back to you because you described at the beginning of this conversation that uh, the people came to you and asked you to make several of these projects, the like Vista Social Club, the Salt of the Earth, and Pope Francis. Um, but I think there's a lot of truth in what Morgan says about uh, uh, filmmakers having their autobiography, even when they're making a biography. And I'd like to ask you to reflect on that. For instance, the Pope Francis film, what you think of your life is in that film. Well, a lot of my life is in my film, I'm a man of faith. I believe in God. When I was young, I even wanted to be a priest, but I got sidetracked by rock and roll. <laughs> and <laughs> and uh, so, if if it's not also about you, I think you can't really handle it. You you have to invest yourself in it. And I mean. And then, of course, there is your subject, and there is the other, and 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 then there is the necessity for all of us to do an interview or have that person speak to us. So, and uh, the interview is a very tricky situation because it's a privileged situation for you, the filmmaker. You sit there with your subject, and you look each other into the eye. And automatically, the audience becomes the third party. And uh, so I feel the interview, I have mixed feelings about the interview. And especially considering that I was going to actually meet Pope Francis and sit with him for hours, I felt, oh boy, that is a privilege. And I cannot keep that for myself. I mean, that position where I'm sitting and he's looking at me, that's where I need to put the audience because... So we came up with the with this way with thanks Errol Morris. We shot this with the Interatron, where you still have an intimate situation with a person, but you share that he looks at you, he or she in this case, he looks at you, and you can share that with the audience. And I think that is a that is so crucial that people who look here in because they're interviewed. I find myself, when I watch, I find myself strangely excluded. And you become the third person. And uh, 
I love with Mr. Rogers that he actually always looked into the camera. And it's very tough for people to look into the camera. Not many people can do that. Not many people can give an answer into the camera. It's hard. Some actors cannot do that. I tried hard with Bruno Ganz, for instance, in Wings of Desire to have him do stuff into the camera. He said, I can't do it. I have to look at somebody. I can't look into a lens. I can't have an emotion looking into a lens. So the interviews with Pope Francis were made so he was looking at my face, thanks to the semi-transparent mirror, which is the greatest invention in the history of cinema. And, and uh, so we were close, but I could share it. And that's the whole thing. We, what we do in, our, in the course, in our profession, is intended to be shared. And that's how we have to treat it. I want to thank our panelists. Vim Vender's latest film is Pope Francis, A Man of His Word, coming to digital platforms on December 4th. Rashida Jones and Alan Hicks's film, Quincy, is now playing on Netflix. Morgan Neville's film, Won't You Be My Neighbor, is now on digital platforms. Susan Lacey's film, Jane Fonda, A Life in Five Acts, is now playing on HBO. This panel was recorded at Doc NYC Pro, the industry conference that runs alongside the Doc NYC Festival. The conference is produced by Eric Johnson. See our show notes for links to earlier episodes of Pure Nonfiction. You'll find longer interviews I conducted with Vim Vendors about his body of work, with Rashida Jones about her Netflix series, Hot Girls Wanted, and with Morgan Neville about 20 Feet from Stardom and Yo-Yo Ma. Thanks to our team, series producer, Sarah Modo, panel recordist, Hannah Nordenswan, sound mixer, Tom Micah, and web designer, Cross Strategy. Our theme music is composed by Andre Williams, and our executive producer is Rafaela Nehausen. I'm Tom Powers. You can follow me on Twitter at T-H-O-M Powers. Pure Nonfiction is distributed by the TIFF Podcast Network. You can read our show notes, learn about live events, and sign up for our newsletter at purenonfiction.net. <laughs>